Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Katie Weaver, Susan Shand, and Anna Mateo. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Katie Weaver. Monkeys have become a big problem around government offices in New Delhi, India. Hundreds of macaque monkeys have been stealing food and wireless phones near Parliament. They are also breaking into homes and frightening civil servants and the public. Very often, they snatch food from people as they are walking, said Ragini Sharma, a home ministry employee. She said the monkeys also sometimes climb through the office windows and destroy documents. An advisory sent to members of parliament in November offered ways to stop monkey attacks. It suggested avoiding three things. Teasing the monkeys, making eye contact with them, and getting between mother monkeys and their young. The fast growth of cities has reduced habitat for macaques, a species with the widest habitat reach in the world. This reduction has caused the animal to hunt for food where humans live and work. In addition, macaques have a spiritual meaning in the Hindu religion. They are believed to be connected to the godlike creature Hanuman, who takes the form of a monkey. So many people in India respect and feed macaques. Ecology researcher Asmita Sengupta said that the tradition of feeding them has led to behavior problems in the monkeys. She is with the Ashoka Trust for Research in Ecology and the Environment. Because people feed them, they expect to be fed, Sengupta explained. So, when people stop feeding them, they become aggressive. In 2015, hundreds of macaques ate through internet wires along the Ganges River, ending Prime Minister Narendra Modi's plan of bringing wireless internet to Varanasi. The holy ancient city is 3,000 years old. And some happenings between monkeys and humans have turned tragic. In 2007, monkeys pushed S.S. Bajwa out of his building to his death. Bajwa was then the deputy mayor of Delhi. Last month, in the city of Agra, home to the Taj Mahal, one of the animals snatched a 12-year-old boy from his mother and killed him. Over time, India has tried many methods for fighting the growth of the monkey population. Several years ago, the country brought in langur monkeys, which are larger and feared by the macaques. But that stopped after keeping langurs in captivity became illegal. Officials found a partly successful solution four years ago. They hired 40 men to dress as langurs and make monkey sounds to try to scare the macaques away. We call them ape repellers 
and they are contract employees, said a government official who asked not to be identified. The method works temporarily as the monkeys flee on hearing the calls, but they return whenever the men leave. S. M. Monath is chairman of the Primate Research Center, a federal agency in the western city of Jodhpur. He suggests three proposals, sterilizing the animals and moving them to forests, removing the ban on their capture for biomedical research, and exporting the monkeys to other countries. I'm Katie Weaver. Andre Pittman and Gregory Corns are on a campaign to remove unwanted, often harmful creatures from Washington, D.C. Their target is not corrupt officials or backroom political operatives. It is instead an animal, the common Norway rat. The capital of the United States is facing a growing rat population. Two of the reasons are mild winter conditions and growth in the city's human population. Washington's government is struggling to keep up with the growing number of rats. On a recent day, health department employees Pittman and Corns work near the U.S. Capitol building. They put pieces of dry ice into suspected rat holes. Another day, they were sent north of the White House, where homeowners have reported rat sightings. On the grounds of a religious center, the two men quickly find the holes where rats hide. Corns uses a long instrument to inject poison into a hole. Pittman watches to see if poison comes up from other holes and then covers those holes with dirt. At the office building next door, the men receive a warm welcome from a security guard. We moved all garbage away from the door because that's where they would feed and party, says the guard. He added that the rats would run over the workers' feet when they left the building at night. The pest control company Orkin rates Washington as America's fourth rattiest city based on the number of new service calls. It is just behind Los Angeles and New York City. Chicago has been number one in each of the past four years. While Washington does not have New York's famous super rats, evidence shows that the D.C. rats are on the march. In September, an apartment building's fire alarm sounded, forcing people to flee for safety. A security camera video showed a rat pulling the alarm. Back on Washington's M Street, Corns and Pittman discover a number of holes in a large planter box in front of an office building. They inject poison and the rats flee. Gerard Brown is the head of Washington's rat control program. He says mild winters have helped fuel an increase in the rate of population. Cold winters do not necessarily kill the animals, but it cuts off their supply of food. During the winter, they stay warm by living in holes underground or under buildings. Most Norway rats live only about eight months, but a full-grown female rat can give birth to 10 babies a month. Washington is enjoying an expanding economy, and the city's population has been rising. The population just passed 700,000, 
more than the U.S. state of Vermont or Wyoming. Brown said the number of restaurants, bars, and coffee houses has increased 25 percent in two years. More people with more money means more restaurants, which means more garbage, which means more rat food, Brown said. In several ways, Washington is an ideal environment for rats. It is filled with large green places. The animals also like the waterfront. Part of D.C.'s growth has resulted from development of areas along the Potomac and Anacostia rivers. I'm Susan Shand. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. A Hungarian doctor is advising her lung disease patients to consider a non-traditional form of treatment, singing. And not just singing while making dinner or washing up at night. As part of their treatment, she wants her patients to sing in public as part of a choir. The Reuters news agency reports that the Breathing for the Soul Choir was formed earlier this year. The group recently performed in the ballroom of a hotel in Budapest. The members of the choir come from hospitals all across Hungary. Many are sick with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease more commonly called COPD. Speaking with Reuters, the choir members explained how singing has improved the quality of their lives. 74-year-old Maria Aranyi has been suffering with serious asthma, a breathing disorder, for over 10 years. Aranyi said that she never thought in her life that she would ever sing. But now, singing in the choir provides relief from what she calls the gray days. She added that after singing, she noticed that she could also breathe more easily. Many lung disease patients and others with chronic disorders can become less involved with other people as they grow older. They may be unwilling to go to new places or to try new things. Over time, if this continues, they can become more and more lonely. Singing with others can be a way to break the cycle of loneliness. Whether it is a choir or any type of singing group, it is a way to make new friends and visit new places. Singing with others is not easy. It takes a lot of practice and offers a challenge, both physical and mental. But the result, hearing your voice blend and harmonize with others, can be truly uplifting. And for most people, singing in a group is easier than singing alone. That can be a frightening experience even for the youngest and healthiest among us. Singing in a group not only gives the lungs a good workout, it can give a sense of community. There is strength and a sense of well-being in numbers. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. From VOA Learning English, welcome to the Making of a Nation. I'm Steve Ember. Last time, we talked about the presidential election of 1804. Thomas Jefferson, the nation's third president, was easily re-elected. 
Jefferson was head of the Democratic Republican Party, known today as the Democratic Party. Thomas Jefferson had a very good record during his first term as president. He ended many taxes, he paid government debts, and he gained possession of the huge Louisiana Territory from France without going to war. His political opponents were the Federalists. The Federalists were sure Jefferson would win the election of 1804. Still, they were surprised by the strength of his victory. Jefferson won 162 electoral votes. His Federalist opponent won just 14. In the early 1800s, Britain and France were at war with each other. The United States remained neutral. Historian Andrew O'Shaughnessy says President Jefferson did not want to become involved in a war. He was sufficiently pro-French that he didn't want to ally with the British, but not so pro-French that he wanted a war with the uh, British. Jefferson also believed getting involved in a European war would destroy all the progress he had made at home. His economic policies had helped to pay much of America's national debt, and he was able to reduce taxes. But staying neutral was not easy. The United States was having trouble with Britain. For many years, Britain had been taking men by force to serve in its navy. Britain claimed the right to seize any British citizen anywhere. The custom was called impressment. Conditions in the Royal Navy were not good at that time, and many sailors deserted. Some went to work on American ships. The American ships were stopped and searched in British waters. Anyone born in Britain was seized. Historian Andrew O'Shaughnessy says sometimes American citizens were also taken. There was also still something of an imperial attitude in Britain towards America. You know, they were still insisting that some American citizens had been born British. Uh, it was often difficult for them to uh, be able to distinguish between their own subjects and Americans. Several thousand sailors were taken off American ships during the early 1800s. In 1807, an incident made relations between Britain and America even more tense. Britain believed that four of its sailors had deserted and fled to an American ship called the Chesapeake. The United States said the men were American citizens who had been forced to serve in the British Navy. The United States refused to return them. When the Chesapeake sailed out of American waters, the British ship Leopard tried to stop and search it. The American captain would not stop. First, the British ship fired two warning shots. Then it fired all its guns directly at the Chesapeake. The American ship could do little to defend itself. The captain surrendered. News of the British attack spread quickly. President Jefferson ordered all British Navy ships in American waters to leave at once. He told people not to aid the British. He said any person, American or British, who disobeyed his orders would be arrested. In response, the British government announced a new rule. It said any American ship sailing to Europe must stop first in Britain to get permission. Ships violating the rule would be seized. 
relations between the two countries were reaching the breaking point. Impressment was just one of the major problems the United States was having with Britain in the early 1800s. Another problem was trade. Britain wanted to stop the United States from trading with France and its colonies. British warships blocked the port of New York all through 1805. No American ship could leave without being searched. Any ship found to be carrying goods for France was taken north to Halifax, Nova Scotia. There, a British court had the power to seize the goods and force the ship's owners to pay a large fine. In the closing days of 1807, President Thomas Jefferson signed a bill banning all trade with Europe. No ships could enter or leave the United States. Jefferson did not believe that trade embargoes were the best way to settle America's problems with other nations, but at the time, he thought an embargo was the only way to deal with Britain and France short of war, and he did not want war. Jefferson later explained why he thought the embargo was the best choice of action. He said, if American ships had sailed out of American waters, they would have been seized by Britain or France. That would have forced the United States into war. Jefferson said it was far better to stop all contact with these nations until they returned to some sense of justice. Jefferson acted to protect American traders, ship owners, and sailors. Yet those were the people who protested the loudest against the ban. They were willing to take the chance of having Britain or France seize their ships and goods. They could not make any money without trade. The situation quickly turned into a political battle between the Jeffersonian Republicans and the opposition Federalists. Federalist newspapers attacked Jefferson. They called him a tool of France and its leader. They charged that Jefferson supported the trade ban to help Napoleon Bonaparte. One Federalist senator wrote a pamphlet against the embargo. He urged Northeastern states to refuse to enforce it. Then he went even further. He met secretly with a British official who was sent to Washington to discuss the situation. He told the British official that Jefferson would be forced out of office because of the embargo. Jefferson simply wished to give the trade embargo a fair chance. He considered the embargo less evil than war. But after a time, he thought, this will not be so. If the war should continue in Europe, and if Britain and France continue to act against us, then it would be for Congress to say if war would not be better than the embargo. Jefferson hoped that the loss of American trade would force Britain and France to change their policies toward the United States. And he hoped the change would come quickly. He knew that the American people would not accept a long ban on trade. A British traveler visiting New York City described what the embargo had done. The port is full of ships, but all of them are closed. Only a few sailors can be seen. Many of the counting houses are closed. The coffee houses are almost empty. The streets near the water are almost deserted. 
grass has begun to grow upon the docks. America's northern industrial states felt the loss of trade most deeply. But the agricultural south also was affected. Rich southern farmers and planters suddenly found themselves poor. Tobacco was one of their major crops, and Britain bought more American tobacco than any other country. Because of the embargo, the price of tobacco fell so low that it had almost no value. The price of wheat fell from $2 a bushel to 7 cents a bushel. Good farmland dropped in value until it was worth almost nothing. Opposition to the embargo was growing. The opposition was strongest in the Northeast. Ship owners and traders believed that the embargo was wrong. They continued to export goods secretly. Some traders began sending goods over land to Canada. From there, the goods were sent on to Britain. Congress passed a law against this kind of trade, but the shipments did not stop. Too many people were willing to violate the law for the large amounts of money they could make by trading secretly with Britain. By August 1808, Treasury Secretary Albert Gallatin had lost all hope that the embargo would be successful. Gallatin told President Jefferson that the embargo was defeated by open violations. Another of Jefferson's supporters gave the president some advice. If the embargo could be enforced, and if the people would accept it, then I am sure it would be the wisest course. But if it cannot be enforced completely, and if the people will not accept it, then it will not serve its purpose and should not be continued. Jefferson, however, was not ready to give up his plan. In his last State of the Union message to Congress, he painted a bright picture of the nation. He reported that American industry was making progress. Many goods that had been imported before the embargo were now being made at home. He said almost all of the national debt had been paid, and he said more than 100 gunboats had been built, enough, he declared, to defend the country. Jefferson said nothing about opposition to the embargo, nor did he talk about the serious economic problems caused by it. He said only that Britain and France still refused to honor American neutrality, and so the embargo must continue. The rest of the nation was not so sure. Congress began debating a number of proposals to either lift or amend the embargo. In the first months of 1809, Congress finally approved a bill. The bill lifted the ban on trade with all European countries except Britain and France. Jefferson had hoped to continue the embargo a little longer and with more powers to enforce it. He was not satisfied with the final bill, but he signed it anyway on March 1st. Three days later, the 15-month-old embargo was dead, and the United States had a new president. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.